We've heard this conversation already. Moving on. Dave, read the note on that hatch. Bro. Roof. Now. Bring Cal. We're doing it, man. We're making this happen. Dave, be the other guy. You are now the other guy. John, take the dowels and sheets from bed and make a tent. Oh, this is so much fun. A huge waste of time, yes. But so much fun. You put the punch card containing the pogo ride into the slot and carve a totem from one of the Crookside dowels. You repeat the process using the card containing the code for the hammer as well as the one with the random code you punched over the shaving cream card for the hell of it. You carve the respective totems for the cards. You do the same thing with the capture logged capture log card. A uh, pretty bare bones looking totem, if you ask you. You stow the totems in your Athenium. The Alchemeter requires one unit of any type of grist to produce one card. You decide to use Shale, since it seems less generally useful than the Build Grist as of now. You make a whole bunch of them. Whoa, did you make all these? Yes. Sweet, thanks! What did you do with all those blue wobbly vase things? I brought the totems out to the Alchemeter to test them. I'm taking some things into my own hands to save some time. Okay. You create a hammer at the expense of two units of build grist. You make a pogo ride too. Minus five build, one shale. You use the totem carved with the random code. You create a... A rocket pack? With some random crap stuck inside of it. Looks like a, uh, a cinder block, a violin, and a flower pot? The items have rendered the device completely inoperable. <coughs> yeah, you figure you might as well put this piece of junk to use. Using a little strategy, first you grab Harry Anderson's Wise Guy by Mike Caveney, then the cards, then your ejected PDA, then the book again to flush the cards into your deck. Nice going! John, turn on Detect Collisions. You flip your Fetch Modi, but find no such option. This is idiotic. An introduction. Who's this wise guy? Blood loss in the Big Easy. New Orleans, 1977. The close-up room at the Magic Castle was this mean little box that tended to fill up with so much smoke you'd swear someone was cremating a wet dog in there. In walks Anderson. There isn't much that gets liquor to pause its journey from the table to my lips, but I'll be the bastard love child of a listless octoroon if that kid wasn't the cat that swallowed the canary in a dapper little hat. It looked like he was testing the tensile strength of his suspenders to the damn near limit with a pair of cocky thumbs. I wasn't impressed. But I was a fool. So in my motion for another beverage, he'd already slipped into polite conversation at a table held down by some notoriously brusque regulars. He had them in no time flat. They were melting butter in his glass ramekins. Whatever tatty yarn he'd spun to win them over, I didn't catch a word of it. One of them laughed. I was angry. Envious? Maybe a little. Yeah, you bet I was. Anderson and one of those little wooden finger choppers that Mickey Hades used to sell. The kind where the blade could be removed easily and clearly shown. It was a very convincing little guillotine that did not look like a novelty store toy. Harry would get a guy to examine the chopper and then cut a cigarette in half. Then he held the guy's hand up and told this silly story. The story, of course, was artifice. A distraction for the guy and the audience while he worked his stuff with the chopper. Or it would become that once his famous chopper trick was perfected, vaulting him to fame, fortune, and the crowning position in the television judiciary. With what became his signature of plum, Anderson was in moments of font of breast pocket gauze, profuse apology, and redoubling determination. 
It's really amazing how hard it is to find a bloody sausage-sized piece of a guy on the floor of a room that dark and smoky. Impossible, I think we all proved. Just as impossible as blind Willie Buttermilk Stubbs was going to find it to work his trumpet tomorrow night without his twiddling fingers. You never really understood what Caveney's relation to Anderson was, or why he wrote this book about him. His ambivalent attitude towards your favorite magician in these anecdotes always struck you as a little weird. And to be honest, you tend not to read much of the text in the book. You mostly like to look at the diagrams for all of the cool tricks. A Hole in the Ace, aka the A-Hole Trick. Here is a perfect example of how Harry could ruin several decks of cards, waste everyone's valuable time, and have you love him for it. He was good at that. One day he noisily emptied his suit jacket pocket into the hood of his car in search of change for the meter. A clunky metal thing slid from the pile and bounced on the sidewalk. As I retrieved it for him, I asked what he was doing with the hole puncher in his pocket. His face lit up with a question like he was an elf and I asked him how he felt about climbing into the hollow of a big tree to bake some cookies or something. The 2 foot 6 inch height differential between us causes these comparisons to enter my mind. A small crowd had already gathered around even before he produced the first pack of unmolested cards. How people seem to gather and how they even know a street performance is about to take place, I'll never know. It's perhaps Anderson's greatest trick, learning the marks like that. I wanted to ask if he was sure about this, performing in broad daylight. He was used to working in dark rooms. It's usually the first thing out of his mouth when he would queer a trick. I'm really more accustomed to working in a darker room than this. But Harry was excited and he had already butchered the first deck of cards with the hole puncher and issued the first round of apologies to the crowd. These were like the primer apologies, that's the sort that got the folks loosened up a bit before the seven course meal of ingratiation that would inevitably follow. He asked me for a fresh deck of cards and I gave him one. The principle behind the trick in theory, as he explained to me later, was to punch holes in what appeared to be one card, but was in fact two or more together, that's the difficulty he often had in squeezing the puncher with his little elfish hands. Then, using some coin maneuvers with his thumb, temporarily concealing the hole he slid the card beneath it with his palm, the hole would seem to disappear or move to another part of the card. Oh yeah, that's right! The old hole in the ace trick! Interestingly enough, pertaining to punching holes in cards and making them disappear and stuff. Your hands were never really strong enough to make this one work all that well either. But actually, that gives you an idea. You overlap two of the punched cards. They mask each other's hole patterns. You carve another totem using the new combined hole pattern. You take it to the alchemeter and... Oh man, looks like Rose made like a million hammers for some reason. Get all of this shit out of the way, you're about to make something sweet! You got the Pogo Hammer! What did you do? I combined the cards with the lathe thingy to make this. It's so sweet, man, look at me go! I see. That was a really good idea, John. Nice work. Thanks, I got the idea from Harry Anderson. Who? Uh, you know the show Night Court? No. Oh, well, bottom line is he's awesome, and that's really all there is to say on the matter. You get a vicious rhythmic bouncing combo going and easily slay the imp in one blow. You and the Pogo Ride are catapulted sky-high in the process. Sweet catch! Hey, uh, that was a pretty, uh, nice, uh... Sweet catch. Save. Oh yeah, this is pretty comfy. Why don't you just, like, carry the bed around with me in it? Up to the gate up there. I can't interact with you directly or anything that you are touching if it will result in moving you. See? Oh, lame. The game probably regards that as kind of cheating. In a way, 
saving you of your free will as an adventurer and the need to advance by your own skill and ingenuity. The server player is just a facilitator. Well, okay. All that scurrying around kind of wore me out. I think I'm going to rest here for a bit. Rose, can you keep the imps at bay, like drop stuff on them if they sneak too close? No. You should pick up your hammer and defend yourself. What? Come on! I have no idea what the hell Dave is up to, or if he's any closer to recovering the game. There's some stuff I'd like to try, in case he doesn't come through. Oh, all right. I'm just going to rest my eyes here for a second, though. Rose, check the alchemy excursus. Looks like a sort of index documenting all known results for punch card alchemy combinations. This could be a convenient resource as you start to stumble on more useful card combinations. But ever since John started punching cards, you've been contemplating other ways this item manufacturing system could be put to use. In particular, if you obtain the code for any item at your disposal, you think you could theoretically send the card to John and he could make it himself. That is, if you can think of anything that would be worth sending to him. You eject the disc and capture log the server CD. Rose, message John the capture code. Oh, god damn it! Whoa, there you are. How's your adventure going, John? It's okay. I'm making some progress, and Rose finally connected again, so she is helping me out now. That's good. Oh, but like, I don't think I'm actually saving the world here. <sighs> I don't know what I'm really accomplishing, but I guess it's not that. Hmm, well, I think whatever it is, it must be pretty important. Don't lose hope, John. I think it'll all turn out for the best if you stay positive. Just keep listening to your grandmother's advice. Yeah, you're probably right, but, uh, I don't think I mentioned Nana to you, did I? Oh, uh, I don't know, didn't you? Huh, I don't know. Maybe you talked to Rose or Dave about it or something. Yeah, maybe that was it! They're, all, they're really weird when they try to talk about you. Like, they're always trying to convince me you have some spooky powers, but I'm always like, no, she seems like a pretty regular girl to me. <laughs> but then, when I think back, maybe there are times it seems like you know some things. Like, maybe you know more about a thing than you're telling me. I don't know. Oh, well, John, I want to explain lots of things to you. Some things that I know. I'm just... waiting. Waiting for what? Oh, John, I forgot! I was messaging you about that meteor that fell near my house. Oh, yeah! Whatever happened to that? Oh, boy. Well, it turns out I was confused about it. Really confused. See, I guess I fell asleep for a while and lost track of time. And that happens! Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Maybe you should, like, wear an alarm clock or something. So, what is the deal with the meteor? Well, it's hard to explain, but... I know what it is now! And I know everything's going to be okay! So, what is it? Or is it just another one of those, you're waiting to tell me stuff? Oh gosh, I really want to tell you all this stuff, but I can't yet. I really think you need to wake up first! Huh? Okay, well, not literally. Well, okay, maybe kinda literally. Oh, stop being so confusing! Well, well, anyway, time for you to go, John. I think you have some company. You stick the pogo hammer back in your strife specibus and get ready to kill some more of those pesky little... Huh? Oh, what's that? Rose! 
Why are you dropping something on that thing? Oh no! John, be the imp! You be the imp and quickly abscond the fuck out of here! This is what weaker adversaries do whenever things get too hot to handle, which is frequently. You stop being the imp because that was stupid and scurry over to your magic chest that you suddenly remembered was on the roof. There are some things in there that would be good to stock up on for a major battle. But it looks like someone has plundered your chest! This is so outrageous! You are being ambushed! There isn't much room to maneuver on this sloping roof. Maybe you should consider making your way to higher ground. John, ascend to the highest point of the house. You go up here. You peek over the edge. It already seems like a long way down to your yard, not even to speak of whatever's below. Hey, weren't your trick handcuffs dangling from that branch earlier? Damn it! Why do imps always got to be making off of all of your sweet gear? You are confronted with a pair of enormous foes! This is it! You have no choice but to wage a fierce rooftop battle! This is totally gonna happen now, and could in no way conceivably be interrupted by a sudden shift in our attention. It's go time! It's time to do this thing! We're doing it, man! We're making this happen! <laughs> 